appreciate y'all checking out this podcast. A great spot for all of us to have some fun and kind of forget what's going on in our world. I'm Brian Fenley. You know that guy over there in Jelani McCoy. Follow us on Twitter, Jelani, to this day, and I don't think this stat will ever change, leads UCLA in block shots, spent several years in the NBA, won a title with the Lakers alongside Shaq and Kobe. Jelani, thanks for doing this. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. Excited to be a part of this. This is an honor to have you. And the word has gotten out, Jelani, and you've talked about this endlessly, about UCLA during the summer and these grand pickup games they have. So much star power. And I was listening to you not long ago during an interview with TMZ that you were on, and you were talking about the intensity of those yeah. UCLA summer exhibition. Everybody comes in, all the stars in the NBA. You were part of this as well. And then you brought right. up the story about when Kobe Bryant was 17 years old and he just totally dominated much older guys. You were there. What was that like? Uh, it, was an, it was an incredible scene. You know, you got to think of a 17-year-old. First of all, you got to convince a 17-year-old to show up and compete <laughs> against a grown man sure. for, you know, a couple hours out of his day. You know, he came in at a disadvantage. But as transcending talent quickly finds out, if you can go in and absorb some information, uh, there be an introvert in the corner, you know what I mean, be a sponge, and then at the same time have some type of talent an athletic ability to get better, which is what he had and he was blessed with. Father was an NBA player. His sister was an athlete. So there's athleticism in the family. But his whole approach at 17 mentally was something that was on par with already a veteran, so to speak. Wow. So it was, it, was, it was a remarkable time. Uh, nobody gave him anything for free. He had to earn everything. He went from uh, getting punked for five days a week to getting punked from four days a week to getting punked from three days a week to actually not getting punked a couple of days a week wow. to actually dominating some of the, you know, as the weeks went on. So that's basketball in a nutshell. Uh, he took his lumps. He showed up every day and took his lumps. He didn't hide. After days where he had a bad day, it's easy for a 17-year-old kid to sure. go back home to mom and dad to the agent and be like, I need something else. But he showed up every day, took the punishment, started dishing out punishment. And, you know, he's, he set his stuff up for, you know, the career that we know and love him about. We know and love him for, which is, you know, the Mamba mentality. Absolutely. And how much of an honor it was for you to get to play with him and, and spend so much time with him. And yeah. we're obviously always grieving his loss and, and what he's done for basketball in general. If I were Jelani to now reverse it here, was there ever a UCLA basketball player during these runs with all, all the NBA guys that you remember playing and in, in almost embarrassing an NBA guy out on, on the court or, or something like that? Do you ever recall anything like that happening? It, 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 took, it took turns, Brian. We had a talented team. You got to remember at the time, the Lakers set, the Clippers set. It was like yeah. football in Los Angeles. UCLA was like the biggest draw of football and basketball in the city. So – uh, I remember times like that, a team consisting of Baron Davis, Toby Bailey, J.R. Henderson, Chris Johnson, and myself beating teams of pros for like two whole days in the wow. main gym. So that, that means at one point in time, it was Toby. At one point in time, it was Chris. At one point in time, it was myself. At one yeah. point in time, it was Baron. I remember one day uh, specifically where Jan, uh, Jalen Rose walked out of the gym and before he walked out, he turned around and screamed at us. He was like, if you guys don't win the national championship, basically, you guys suck. Oh, my you know gosh. I mean? <laughs> wow. And he kind of just walked out of the gym. So, you know, we had a lot of talent. We had a great coach and Coach Herrick and a great coaching staff. Lorenzo Romar, who went on to coach uh, the Washington Huskies sure. and put a lot of pros. Uh, Mike Godfrey, who went to Alabama. Steve Lavin, who's had a lot of pros. So, we were confident in the coaches that we had, you know what I mean, who were there to help us uh, develop the talent that we needed. And uh, it was just being in that experience and being around that environment, and it forged us. It was almost like a double down on player development because we got our coaches de uh, development and we got to experience, you know, firsthand experience against NBA players. Was it true, Jelani, and Jelani McCoy joins us, former UCLA Bruin, Lakers, spent many years in the NBA. The yeah. story you were telling about the, the, the Bruins going over to the Warner Brothers lot 
during the filming yeah. uh, of Space yeah. Jam, Michael Jordan. What what do you remember from all that? Hey, we only we only tell truths. It just so happened to be like we we're in the media capital of the world at one point in time, and like a lot of these stories, a lot of my teammates and myself haven't been in Los Angeles. We were actually there. So the year they filmed uh, uh, Space Jam, uh, Warner Brothers had to create a whole basketball situation for Michael Jordan because he didn't want to not be training while he was filming Space Jam. Wow! So they built this dome where uh, they built this dome where he had a weight training facility and, a, you know, 94 feet of court to play on. So the first invitation went out to the UCLA men's basketball team who had just won the national championship at the time. You know what I mean? So while Mike was filming there for a month or two, we had an opportunity to go up there and play pickup basketball. Um, for your favorite stars, stop by just to watch. And NBA players, you know, from Penny Hardaway to Sean Kemp, you know, All Star. Some of his Bulls uh, teammates were were there just playing pickup basketball. So it was a it was a phenomenal experience. I had another opportunity from that to hang out with Michael Michael Jordan on the solo. Wow. So I mean, it was just like a only thing. You know, it's the reason why you go to UCLA at the end of the day to be involved. And, sure. You know, not only athletics but entertainment. You know, academics. Oh, you're absolutely in the epicenter of all of that. Right. From your UCLA time, how do you think fans remember you? And Jelani, how do you want them to remember you? That's a weird question, Brian, man. I don't know how to answer that. Uh, I, I don't, I know, I know people remember me for, you know, I mean, the suspension and the other things that went on uh, with UCLA, but from the UCLA players, the fan base, the alumni, some of the players that I play with, uh, I just want to be known as a good basketball player. You know, what I, mean? I did a lot to sacrifice. We had to come into a national championship team as a 16-year-old freshman, you know, turned 17-year-old when Pac-10 started. Wow. That's a different story. So wow. I had to make a lot of sacrifices to play on a championship team, which I had no problem for. Um, I still hold a lot of records. Like like yeah. you say, I still got a lot of uh, – I still get a lot of love from my teammates, not only UCLA players, but we're talking about some of the legends uh, that went to UCLA. First sure. team All-Americans, I get a lot of support for them. So, you know what I mean? I know personally, you know, if you hold records, and you know what I mean, you play minutes and you hold certain titles and you win, you know, I know what my stake is personally as a UCLA basketball player. You know what I mean? I know where I feel my talent ranks. I, I just uh, I don't expect anybody, Brian, to remember me any type of way. You know what I mean? My thing as a player and from my experience and from beating myself up uh, for certain ways that my career went, when you start to get the acceptance from your peers and somebody from the outside looking in or see your idols and things like that, when you start running into guys in the NBA that admire you from afar at a different college that might totally. have a higher trajectory of your career than you. You know what I mean? These talking about all stars remembering playing against you, stealing some of your moves, remembering exact moments. So those are the things that I take away, you know, as a player. And I try to tell other players, you know, regardless of how your career went. So, you know, look to your peers and it's cool to, you know, uh, uh, be admired and loved on by some of the fans. But like we spoke of, and some of the reasons like you go, to some of these places because you can experience these things. You have sure. first hand experience. So it's kind of hard going back and forth between you should have did this and you should have did that. And you're like, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, who are you again? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean? You don't want to be that guy, but you're talking about dreams and deferred dreams and blood, sweat and tears to people from high school to a AU high school, you know, all the way up to the pros, you know what I mean? So, uh, you get a little calloused yeah. in some of these conversations. You know what I mean? You have every right to be, but you want to respect the opinions of fans just as long as they're uh, knowledgeable. Yes, <laughs> it's true. And not recency biased and not sure. just throwing out hyperbole and things they saw on Instagram and stuff. So we always respect as players when you go to blue bluegrass programs, UCLA, Kentucky, Kansas, you understand the people who have the knowledge of the game. Sure. Uh, I've, I've had support from people that have season tickets since Lou Alcindor. Wow. That I've been in Los Angeles or in San Diego that came up and showed me my support. Uh, when I started coming back around the program, you know what I mean? I started got, getting a lot more love. So 
uh, I just try to take away from my teammates. Absolutely. Family, you know what I mean? Some of the, your other peers that you played against, you know what I mean? I just try to take notes and, you know, pointers from that aspect of my life as to worrying about how do I, how would I want to be remembered? You know I mean? Oh, absolutely, John. I think you nailed it because, look, I mean, there are they're the armchair quarterbacks out there, you know, yeah. but they never played at the level you played. They never experienced that. And so you're right. so smart to view it that way. And look, you had the 11 block game. I think that was against Maryland. You had a triple double. Yep. You had a triple double and that like never happens at UCLA right. basketball. So you're doing all these things and you were playing so well. And did you ever feel like the pressure was just, I mean, it was a lot because when you were so young and yeah, people yeah. were already trying to compare you to Bill Walton and Kareem and yeah. as a youngster, how does an 18 year old or even younger Jelani try to handle all that? You know what? I had a great support system. I went to a little all boys school in North Park that helped me. <laughs> St. Augustine High School sure. in San Diego that, uh, that helped prepare me for this. Uh, I had a breast fan who was also Daryl Russell, rest in peace, who was the number two pick in the NFL draft. So I had somebody like, you know, to bounce ideas off of sure. or to be like, when it's getting crazy, I can look at somebody directly and be like, this is really crazy, isn't it? And, you know, it was literally somebody that was in the same situation at the same time I was and a year ahead of me. So I was able to bounce ideas off of him and learn through his experiences and some of these things. That I just had a, you know, we had a great group of fans that didn't think we were too cool at the time. Sure. Maybe because we went to a all boy school. All we did was kind of laugh and hang out with each other and, you know what I mean, pal around. So uh, I had a great support group, you know, uh, uh, just – Good, good friends, man. Yeah. Good friends at the end of the day. Baron Davis has to be one of your close friends, so, somebody yeah. that, that you guys played with together at UCLA and have grown ever since to be, to be great buds. When did you see, when you first met him and he walked onto campus, when did you know that he had greatness in him? Well, Baron, we, Baron was always around. He was a younger kid on the same AAU team as me with Pat oh, Coach. Wow. Shout out Pat Barrett. It's called Performance Training Institute at the time. Our head coach was Gary McKnight from Modern Day, and our assistant coach was Pat Barrett, who headed up the club program. So Baron was always around, one of the younger players. I know Baron since he's been in like maybe the eighth grade. Wow. Um, when he was getting recruited from Utah to UCLA, they sent me to watch him play. Wow. Uh, with Chris Johnson okay. to, you know, facilitate to show him, you know. Sure. Okay. So I've been a, a part of Barron's life since he's probably been in the eighth grade. We're business partners. We work on the same platform uh, till this day called Slick Sports Lifestyle and Culture, a, a media company cool. that tells sports uh, stories throughout sports lifestyle and culture. Wow. Um, so we've been able to maintain that uh, working relationship and a friendship. And, uh, you know, we've been able to compete, each, compete against each other in the pros. And, you know, so, you know, Baron Davis is one of the greatest point guards of all time, uh, barring a couple of injuries. So sure. I've just been fortunate to maintain a relationship. You know how life is. People go in and out of each other's lives. Sure. We've been able to, you know, stay close and uh maintain our friendship throughout the years and you know it's just been a blessing just being around guys like that but that's what UCLA is that's why we all committed that's why we all came and you know that's why we are we're all on a group chat like I'm getting group wow. chat notifications right now from you know Baron Davis so Matt cool. Barnes Rico Hines Earl Watson Ryan wow. Hollins Ty Ramsar uh, Ryan Bailey so we're all still in group chats you know like you are so yeah. we're all still in group chats hanging out you know till this day so you know what I mean? It's all that. I actually, so I work a little bit over at, at Fox uh, Sports Radio, and I've gotten to meet Ryan over there. And yeah, he's a great guy. We've had, I've had him on the podcast too. Great guy, man. And you guys, so he, he was obviously a little younger than you. Yes. But, but again, like you said, another a Bruin who, when it comes to your peers, you guys all respect each other so much, and that's so important. Right. Moving on from college, Jelani, and then going to the NBA. And right now we've got this work stoppage in the NBA. And when you were drafted, there was, I think, the lockout, right? That was there kind was, of – There was. Yeah. So 
what was that experience like for you dealing with that? And then how do you think that might be similar to what the guys are dealing with right now? That's a good. That's good. Good. Justin, you pulled that one out, Brian. That's a good <laughs> comparison. That's a good comparison. I got to do some homework. It's Jelani yeah, McCoy on here. You did, you did I don't want to just show up. <laughs> <laughs> that 98 lockout year, you know, for me was – it, uh, it, it was a trip because at the time, like, if, if that lockout doesn't happen in 1998, your whole idea of what Jelani McCoy played basketball would have changed because at the time, I was working out with Phil Weber. Shout out Phil Weber, who ended up being an assistant coach for many years in the NBA with the Suns and other teams. I was probably basically like the black Dirk Nowitzki. So I was working out five days a week with Ricky Davis. Wow. You know, yeah. Oh, but we had the same agent, Aaron Tellum, you know, which who Kobe was also under that uh, okay. umbrella, which is why we had that other relationship. But I was working out like five days a week uh, with shooting, you know, that had nothing to do with dunking and drop steps. I had to figure that we had pretty much figured that out. So I spent my whole time getting you ready for the draft with ball handling and shooting with Ricky Davis and Phil Weber. So I was, like, knocking down shots left and right, hitting 8 out of 10 on NBA three-point shots on the regular, getting thousands of shots up per week. So I was ready for – but when that lockout hit, you know, there was no work. There were no workouts. We didn't know if we were going to play the whole season, you know what I mean? So it kind of got haywire. But it's a lot similar to what these uh, these guys got going now, you know what I mean? And at the same time, like, there was no COVID-19. Like, we could still get with coaches or trainers – yeah, or teammates or older guys that were in the NBA, they don't have that right now. They're doing sure. like I talked to Rico Hines on the phone and Ryan Forehand Kelly, two friends of mine, sure, coaching the NBA, and they're doing workouts on Zoom. Wow, yeah, which is completely the antithesis of what you know NBA and development is. That's really like boxer hands on training. Your foot <laughs> needs to go here, you need to be listening for this. You know, so much of those things are, are, are feel and sensations. Sure. The nuances that the body feels that I can't feel you. Like I can jump up and down over on this camera right now, but you <laughs> wouldn't feel it. Sure. If I was in that room with you and I jumped up and down and I was moving, that's a different energy and development totally. all together. But they're those they're doing a great job of trying to figure that out. So I mean, you got to work with what you got, Brian. <laughs> you know what I mean? At the end of the day, you know what I mean. You're right. They don't have the access to the gyms and the air conditioned facilities that they grew, you know, these younger players grew up with, they got to take it back to the yeah. days of like when we grew up, when you had to sprint from, you know, from tree to tree for a workout ah. or, you know what I mean? You had to dribble from home to school with the basketball. You know what I mean? I might not have to do nothing with basketball. I have to ride a bike. I have to climb a tree. I have to hop a fence. <laughs> you might, you might have sure. to, you know what I mean? Little things like that, that we did back in the day. We didn't have Vertimaxes and all this new equipment when the Charles Barkleys and the Shaquille O'Neal's and the Bo Jacksons and the football, you know what I mean? So a lot of this stuff was, hey, I'm going to jump over this creek over and over again five times because I need to be outside, you know, sure. for the next hour with no equipment. Yeah. So we, we were talking about this the other day with a good friend of mine, how even when you didn't have a hoop, like you dribbled in the front of your house and if you had a square, you know, on on the, you know, the little square pavements, if the ball hit the middle of the square, that was a bucket. Wow. It's just imagination, man. You know what I mean? Working with what you got, you know, going back to the days of when kids played outside. And, you know, we used to have street races when I was small. You know, we weren't in, you know, it was Nintendo hour, then everybody was like, I'm faster than you. Yeah. No, you're not. You know what I mean? Well, you know what I mean? I beat him last week and he's faster than you. Okay, so wow. let's prove it. Let's all three of us race yeah. from here to the stop sign. And then you got your guys on the side who don't yeah. race that are side busting and, you know, cheering it on and, you know, they play some side bets and, you know, talking it a little deal. So sure. that's kind of what led up to 90s basketball and what it is. So it's almost a good thing and a bad thing, you know what I mean? Because there's going to be a bridge where we're going to be forced to honor the old players and the old ways of player development and the old ways of which basketball was learned right now kids have trainers they have ipads they have dribble up you know the ball where you can get the registers your dribbles you know what i mean right now we're going to be forced to go back to honor the old ways 
in which we learn basketball, in my opinion, in my humble opinion. I, I'm, I'm with you. I think nothing beats 90s basketball. I had so much fun watching that style. And how much the game has changed, Jelani, in the last couple decades and everybody's shooting threes. And you look at the Rockets and they're not even playing with a big man. And, and yeah. look at what you – I mean, and, and you were a force in the middle. So it's so different. How – sustainable is the direction of the NBA and where they're going as far as the style of which they're trying to play. You know, it's a fad and it's up to the fans, you know, yeah. I mean, every, in every league, you know, sure. every commissioner is going to tell you we want scoring up Yeah, from baseball to football to hockey, whatever we want scoring up. You sure. know what I mean? We just want to score, 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 score. Everybody's happy, yada, yada, yada. But I think, what we're seeing when everybody's watching these throwback videos and these hardwood classics, we're going to see the reintroduction of defense and yes. how fun it was to watch somebody score and then stop somebody. Yes. What's wrong with scoring and then stopping somebody from scoring? The buddy buddy, you know what I mean? You score, I score, he scores, and then the other guy scores if he got stuff on. You know what I mean? I feel like there's got to be a hybrid to that. I know they're working with, I think on average, maybe in between, 15 to 20 extra possessions because of the pace of the game. Yeah. So that has nothing to do with the defensive effort that can be done. It's an exciting game. It could be shown defensively as well as offensively, you know what I mean, in basketball. So I hope at some point in time we can get back to highlighting both aspects. The mid-range thing is weird. Like, that's cool. That's like a weird flex to me. Like, you yeah. got analytics and you got smart people around and you – I can, we can make analytics look like anything, Brian. Sure. Put our heads together and say, hey, Brian, let's come up with some analytics yeah. to prove this is better than that. And, sure. You know, let's put an algorithm to it. You yeah. know what I mean? Put some nerds on it and track it. And, yeah. Know, start highlighting the, 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 the things that we can use, you know, to prove our point. So, you know what I mean? Like, like I said, it's, I think it's a delicate balance, but I think we're at a good time where right now, you know what I mean, we're going to be forced to look at the old ways that we used to view with uh, basketball. I'm with you, John, and I'm sure you got to go. I'm sure you're no, busy. No Are you sure? Okay. Uh, your favorite moment from your time in the NBA? What moment, when you think about, when somebody says, Jelani, your career, and the first thing that comes to your mind after that? Yeah, you know, there's so many different moments. When you play on different teams, yeah. different moments are your moments for different reasons. I would love to tell you, it's like when I had a, you know, my highest career uh, rebound total. Sure. Or, you know what I mean, or or when I did this. But, um, you know, when you're in the NBA, like, it, it's not the moments that you think. You know what I mean? It's it's, it's little in, intimate moments with yourself and another player that generally nobody sees. You know what I mean? But one of my favorite moments will obviously have to be winning the title with the Lakers, yeah. my childhood team. Uh, another favorite. I'll, so I'll pick two for you, Brian. I got two. Okay, cool. One will be giving the Lakers one of their worst defeats in Laker history as a Sonic. Oh, wow. Right? And then the other will probably be winning the title for the Lakers after that. Wow. Yeah. I didn't get to play. It was a weird year. You know, like I said, the year previously, we held, I started for Seattle. And we handed them their worst love, one of the worst losses in Laker history. The following year, I had to ride the bench, you know what I mean, behind Slava, Mad Dog, Samaki Walker, Shaq, Robert Dory. I was already coming to a team that, you know what I mean, was back-to-back -back champions. I actually turned down a guaranteed deal to play for an opportunity to play for a non-guarantee with the Lakers. My agent was oh. pissed. Rest ah. in peace, Dan Fagan. He was hot. Kiki Vandaway, UCLA guy, was mad. He was like the GM with the Nuggets at the time. Yeah. Like, I was like, I don't care. I'm doing this. It's the Lakers. You know what I mean? It's a chance for a three-peat. Uh, I got it. Like I said, I got to learn a lot that year about what, you, what it takes to be a championship, be around Kobe, Shaq, Phil Jackson, you know what I mean, all those guys. Um, I like to look at it as not a wash. You know what I mean? Not playing that year, playing a couple games here and there, playing preseason. But – the learning experience was phenomenal. You know what I mean? Hindsight 2020, you know what I mean? Uh, Kobe's no longer with us. So, you know what I mean? I can't take back those moments and the relationship yeah. I had with him. So I would have to pick those two moments. What was that relationship like, Jelani? 
um, every his relationship was different for everybody. You know what I mean? I was an opportunity where we had the same agent for a long time. You know what I mean? When you got to LA, he came up to the men's jam. He was playing in the rhymes. He was working out up there. So our relationship was purely, um, it was almost not even basketball. I think we had like one basketball and run in during a practice, you know what I mean? Where I kind of like, uh, wasn't playing or like he was picking on me that practice just to make sure that I was motivated. Okay. And in, you know what I mean? And not like going off to left somewhere and knowing that I wasn't playing. And he explained that to me afterwards when I was kind of pissed that he kind of did it to me, you know, in the locker room. But ever since then, it was just life. It was creative ways. I used to ask some questions about his Adidas shoes and making him change colors and on his shoes. You know what I mean? Uh, just picking that, just, music just life you know what i mean basketball is the conduit you know what i mean for us to start talking about life and similarities and dislikes and you know what i mean and family experiences so when you're in the nba you're in a situation you just want to be able to provide not only uh the confidence in your teammates of a Shaq and kobe to be able to rely on you in a situation when you're playing games but you want to be there as a friend and as a teammate, you know what I mean? You also want to know what he's watching, what he's listening to. You also want to be a ear because, uh, you know, when you're playing high-level basketball and you're a professional athlete, you almost forget it, to be human. And you know what I mean? That's when, you that's when you know, things can go left on you. So you, you just want to be a friend. You just want to be a friend. We, you know, basketball, we're there 24-7, 365. We're watching film. We're talking on the plane. We got the scouting report. They're sliding under the door. We got a walkthrough. We're going to be basketballed out. What I'm proud and what the NBA has done today is uh, allowing players to work on their off the court because you can't build up something as a man physically without letting a man build up the mental aspect of what he needs to do too. Sure. So, right. And a lot of those things are the off the court interests. So I was one of the champion. I suffered early on in my career. I was one of the guys who asked a lot of questions, read a lot of books, tried to talk to the owners, the sponsors, uh, you know what I mean? Kind of did things that were like not strip club and not dice game and not sure. this, you know what I mean? I had interest in film. I yeah. was writing. I opened up a, a small production company when I first got into the league. So those things that I, uh, that I did back then in 98, 99, with the, the what I went through with UCLA, they are like, oh, he don't want to play no basketball. He already just went through this. Now he's talking about stories and writing and, you know, business, you know what I mean? It's all things to decide. Where now, those are almost the players that they're looking for. They want players with off-the-court interest. They want players with a high intellect, not only for basketball, but off-the-court, because it only makes everybody else look that much better. Exactly. You know I mean? when, um, when the product is looking good on the court and off-the-court, it can go uh, anywhere as well. And that's what we're seeing now. In 2020, we're seeing that this, the, the business of basketball is a global entity, right? So you can't just be the guy on basketball averaging 30 and be – you can, but you know what I mean? You're going to get put in a certain funnel, but you can also be celebrated for what you want to do off the court because at the, at true – uh, true uh, masterminds, true P2 masters know that the on the court and the off the court is basically the same thing. It's development, it's mastery, it's discipline, it's thinking out of the box. And how can I do that on a physical level, but not do that on a mental level? And, and especially like, it's all about branding, right? Like if you're, you're a basketball player and then what you can do off the court is a brand and you could help mm -hmm. the team you're on by building mm -hmm. that brand. It gives more attention to the team more money that way with Kobe obviously he had roots in Italy you mm -hmm. played in foreign countries as well and yeah. what was the craziest story when you were playing internationally that you remember because some of these places it must have been like something you'd never seen before uh, in China uh, a guy threw a water bottle on me from a crowd in the crowd which I saw a car cop coming out of the corner of my eye caught threw it back at him in the crowd, yeah. hit him in the face, water goes everywhere. Like, and then looks like this riot ensues in China where they have to throw out the, the you know how you see soccer when they bring out that long tunnel? 
because people in Europe, they throw stuff. Yeah, yeah. And they don't yeah, dislike sure. it. You know what I mean? Overseas, they'll throw coins, they'll throw bottles, they'll throw babies, phones, you know what I mean? What, whatever it is. So every, literally every uh, Ukraine, I had somebody snooping in my par- apartment. The Russians, you know what I mean? The, mm. the, the, almost the Russians yeah. tapping my phones, uh, cutting my phone off in the middle of the night. Uh, people are in my apartment. Uh, Spain owes me money. Italy owes me money. Jeez. You know what I mean? Every, literally every stop we run, it's weird coming from an NBA place for seven or eight years and then having to deal with my bats are back and forth for the first couple of years and then the last five uh, having to deal with overseas stuff. So it was yeah. literally every single stop was a story, yeah. uh, a documentary, if you will. You know what I mean? If I'd have kept cameras on, on me, yeah. you know what I mean? I had a little mini docs in every situation. So, sure. you know what I mean? It's everybody that it, it's weird going overseas because they almost forced you to be the mad, the mad black American. Huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Every, uh, overseas players yeah, I know what I'm talking about. You know what I mean? But you have to fight for your money. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, you're, you're away from your, you're away from out of the country, you know, doing what you love, thinking you're putting food on your table for your family, for yourself, and people are playing with your money. And then you have to go play. Then you have to get, you know, get acclimated to the food, the climate, sure. the health situations. You don't have trainers. You don't have weights. You don't have ice. You don't have braces in some of these situations. So you learn a lot about yourself overseas. You learn to really grow up. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Really not speaking languages and having to learn non-verbal communication, then having to assimilate with some parts of the language. You so like a master's class. So yeah. for those people who didn't get to finish college, if you go overseas and play basketball, you basically get a master's degree. Oh my gosh first-hand accounts of stuff that you will never learn in a classroom. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I wonder, and as we kind of wrap up here, Jelani, because I know you got a lot to do and I'm so, first of all, so grateful for your time. Really. No, I really appreciate, appreciate it. I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, the ability to use all that stuff now as a coach and, and someone that you enjoy coaching and giving back. So yeah. even amongst all those experiences, some of them were, were horrible that you had to deal with, but mm-hmm. In a way, can you look at it as, man, I learned that and now I can funnel it in in a way where I can even be a better teacher? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I learned, I, I mean, you can only hope to learn from all of your experiences, good and bad. I think that's part of mastery. Um, uh, I learned from those experiences. I've been in a lot of situations where, you know, I've had hard coaches. I had every kind of coach you can imagine. I had the too cool coach, the too mean coach, the hybrid the coach didn't really know what he was doing. The other, like I've had every single coach that you can imagine in every walk of life and everything that you can do. Sure. You should hope to be able to pull from your experiences, both negative and positive. Um, I kind of steered away from the coaching uh, uh, recently because of the parents. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's a, we, we could have a whole another podcast on sure. you know, the parents. And yeah. from, you know, we're talking about from six years old on the way up to 22 years old. You know the uh, unrealistic goals. You know what I mean. That sure. the 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 entitlement of even the parents. You know sure. what I mean. The 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 not the non knowledge of the space. You know what I mean. Yeah. So that kind of turned me off from the development side of basketball. I'm always going to consult. I'm always going to work with guys getting ready for the draft. You know sure. what I mean. Guys who you know what I mean trajecting on a certain path, but. I was just, uh, as far as development, like we need to have a development package for the parents as well. You know what I mean? Every kid is born with the inherent want to do things correctly, right? You want to do things right. Nobody wakes up. I I would hope not, you know what I mean? Considering their circumstances of what went on. Nobody wakes up in life wanting to suck. Yeah, exactly. Even if they're doing bad things. Even if they're doing bad things, they want to do the bad things right. You know what I mean? So there is <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. So That's no, true. Everybody has an inherent ability to want to do right. But where is the communication coming from? Sure. Where is the farm? I call it a farm. I can't game you up and then you go back to mom and dad and they tell you something completely opposite that's poisoning the you know, the natural stuff that I'm trying to give you. So uh as far as coaching and development, I think that it has to be, you know what I mean, from the parents. Like you can't be on a diet 
you know what I mean? And then, you yeah. know what I mean, go home and every, you got cookies and hostess and everything in the house. Yeah. It has to be a complete buy-in. So as with any type of development, I was hoping that we can all buy in from coaches, AU guys, uh, you know what I mean? Whatever it is, there's a space for everybody that we all need to collaborate sure. for the betterment of the youth and the development. Jelani McCoy, if you haven't written a book already, when it's you coming, do, Brian. when you do, I better get a signed copy, please. For sure, it's gonna be back there on that wall for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, Jelani. Let's do this again sometime, man. This was a lot of fun, and I'm from San Diego too. So maybe once all this, you know, COVID stuff goes by, that's the only reason why I did this because you're a San Diego guy. You have been from Fresno or something else, I'd have blown you off. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh well thank goodness san diego no man. and you rep san diego so well jelani thanks for doing this man and uh no we'll talk to you soon yeah stay classy san diego <laughs>